Welcome to Horror Babble. Forgotten Weird Tales Volume 3 continues today with a rare work by the regular Weird Tales contributor, Alton Edie. Though Edie wrote a good number of stories for the magazine throughout the 20s and 30s, he's something of a mysterious figure in the world of weird fiction. He passed away in his late 40s in 1935. Today's offering, which was published in the September 1929 edition of Weird Tales, is called Warning Wings. We hope you enjoy it. Warning Wings by Alton Eady Steady, sir, please don't do that. Quietly as the words were uttered, their tone of urgent entreaty was such that I stopped dead, and allowed my hand, already raised, to crush the moth which had for the past half-hour been blindly dashing itself against the bulb of the electric table-lamp, to fall limply to my side. Surprised at the unexpected exclamation, and secretly somewhat amused at his evident concern for the life of the fluttering insect, I turned and faced the speaker. He was a fresh arrival at the hotel, for his face was unfamiliar to me. Tall and broad-shouldered, with a neatly trimmed, pointed grey beard, his features tanned to that warm, even tone which only the sea can give. One does not need to spend many hours in the neighbourhood of the Southampton waterfront before becoming accustomed to the type to which he belonged. Evidently he was an officer of one of the ocean liners, which are to be counted by the score in the docks nearby. There was a flicker of amusement in his keen grey eyes as he stepped forward in answer to my look of surprise. "'Seemingly this little wanderer of the night has incurred your displeasure,' he observed, pointing to the moth which had now renewed its frantic dashes against the brightly lit globe. It seemed so determined to beat its life out that I thought it only kindness to end its misery. I shrugged. The stranger shook his head slightly. There is another way. He stepped toward the lamp, and after several attempts managed to catch the little creature between his capped hands. Then, holding it with infinite tenderness, he crossed to the open window and allowed it to flutter away into the summer night. As he turned, after shutting the window, I saw that he was regarding me with a queer little half-smile. You may think it strange that I should take the trouble to preserve the life of an insect that another man would crush without a second thought, he said, but I have a fondness for moths, especially of that particular kind. Oh, you mustn't run away with the idea that I'm a learned entomologist, he went on with a laugh. As a matter of fact, I do not know the scientific name of the species although its common designation is, I believe, the ghost moth. No, sir, my action just now was purely sentimental. The sight of those tiny fluttering wings brought back the memory of a strange adventure, which I had in mid-Atlantic many years ago. A faraway expression had crept into his eyes, only to vanish the next moment, as he turned again to me, and resumed briskly, If I tell you the story— it may serve for both explanation and excuse for my unwarrantable intrusion just now. I hastened to assure him that no excuse was necessary, but at the same time I hinted rather strongly that I should be glad to hear the account of what had happened. To confess the truth, I was not a little curious to know why such a strong bond of sympathy existed between this clear-eyed, matter-of-fact man of the world and the little white moth. Sailors' yarns are seldom uninteresting to a landsman, and occasionally they are true as well. Whether this one comes in the latter category I am unable to guarantee, but I can vouch for the fact that the teller of it did not look like a man who would gain any satisfaction from twisting the ankle of a casual stranger. As I listened to the story being told in his deep, earnest voice, glancing occasionally into the speaker's frank, bronzed face, I know that I believed every word of it. At the present time, I am in command of the RMSS. He mentioned the name of a famous Atlantic flyer which had arrived at Southampton the previous day. But at the time of which I am about to speak, some twenty years since, I was in charge of a smaller vessel belonging to the same line. I was a youngish man then, 
as liner captains go, and she was my first command. You must not imagine that I was nervous on that account, for I'd been in the ferrying trade ever since I'd taken my third mate's ticket, and I flattered myself that I knew the lane blindfold. I suppose it sounds strange to you when I speak of a lane across the Western Ocean. <laughs> if you talk about the sea to the average landsman, he conjures up a vision of the trackless deep, a phrase which he has learnt from story-writers who have more poetical imagination than actual seagoing experience. True, there was a time when the shipmaster was left free to set his course by the most direct route from port to port, and especially was this so in the days when the competition between the different shipping companies led their captains to strain every nerve to secure the speed record for their particular ships. But all that is changed now, with the furnaces of a modern liner eating up a ton of coal every one and a half minutes, to say nothing of the food and wages bills mounting up, it is essential for the captain to maintain speed, and the man who takes a forty-three thousand tonner at twenty-five knots through the zone of drifting icebergs, and the fogs which lay over the Grand Banks in summer, is simply asking for trouble. Consequently, two lanes are marked out on his chart, the northern and most direct sea passage, to be followed when the icebergs are bound up by the Greenland winter, and the fog zone off the Grand Banks is of smaller area, and the southern, which is calculated to pass outside the limit to which the bergs drift before melting, and to avoid the larger fog area over the banks. For the Southampton boats, the course is set from the Lizard. Those coming from Liverpool set theirs when they drop the fastnet light off the southwest coast of Ireland, while those coming north about, through the Pentland Firth, steer from a spot well to the norward of the rocky islet of Rockall. And once the course is set, the helm is not shifted unless it is in response to a signal of distress. It is necessary for me to make these details quite clear, in order for you to appreciate the position of difficulty in which I found myself, during the particular voyage I am about to describe. It was June when we sailed from this port, so we were due to take the southern route. We stood down channel until the bishop light was winking away on our starboard beam, it stands on an outlying reef of the Scilly Isles, and is the last beacon you pass sailing west. Then the course was set west three-quarters south, which brought the ship into the usual summer route. A little over three days' steaming brought us into the neighbourhood of thirty-five degrees of longitude west of Greenwich. At this point, our track met the track of the Liverpool and Queenstown boats, and, according to schedule, our bows were pointed farther south, which— made our course west-south-west. You must understand that I am describing the track we followed twenty years ago. Since the Titanic disaster in 1912, the route has been altered, so that it now swings more to the southward, until it reaches the same latitude as the Azores, after which it curves north again to New York. Well, we shifted our helm, as I have said, about one bell in the first watch, 8.30 p.m. sure time, and shortly afterward I came off the bridge to turn in. I took a last look round before going below. It was one of those perfect nights which make passengers think that a sailor's life is all beer and skittles. <laughs> the ship was threshing her way over the gentle swell, with scarce a tilt showing on her long lines of decks. The stars shone bright in the cloudless sky. The slight following breeze was hardly strong enough to lift the drooping folds of the ensign at our stern. It seemed that, on such a night, the most nervous of new-fledged captains might sleep in peace. <laughs> Certainly no thought of sudden and unexpected disaster was in my mind when I threw myself down on my cot to sleep. But for some unaccountable reason sleep would not come to me. I tossed restlessly from side to side— got up and opened the ports of my cabin, closed them again, tried the old trick of counting the steady beats of the throbbing propeller. But all in vain. In spite of my effort to overcome it, the sense of expectant wakefulness seemed to increase rather than diminish. At last I gave up the struggle, and, switching on the light, took a book from the rack and settled myself to read. It was then that I noticed, for the first time, a vague sound mingling with the familiar noises of the ship. 
At first it seemed nothing more than a soft, intermittent tapping. But as I continued to listen, I noticed that the same number of taps was repeated again and again, subconsciously at first, but soon with awakened interest. I realized that the sounds fitted into certain letters of the Morse code. I laid the book aside, and sat up, listening. Tap, 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 tap. I raised my eyes to the spot whence the sound proceeded, and at once saw what was causing it. Attracted by the light, a tiny white moth had entered the porthole, and was now fluttering frantically against the illuminated dial of the tell-tale compass that was fixed in the ceiling above my bed. The soft tapping had been caused by the creature dashing itself against the glass in its effort to reach the light within. I smiled to myself, as I saw the commonplace explanation of the sounds which had so puzzled me, but at the same time I could not help being struck by the fact that the noise it was making was strangely like the Morse code. But I was in no mood to be kept awake by so trivial a thing. Picking the towel from the rack, I mounted on the cot, and raised my hand to sweep the little creature out of existence, even as you were about to crush that other moth in this room a few minutes since. But just as I was about to strike, the moth's flutterings began afresh. Tap, 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 tap. I stood like a man turned to stone, as the real meaning of this chance-spelt signal rushed upon me. It was S.O.S., the sailor's call for help. Nor was this all. I had already noticed that the creature had come to rest in the same position every time it had finished the ninth stroke, but now I saw that its head was resting on the compass at almost exactly the same point where our present course lay. The difference was only a quarter of a point to the southward. That is to say, we were heading west-south-west, whereas the course indicated by the moth was west-south-west, quarter-south. Even as I stood staring, the signal was repeated. The light, feathery wings beat the air once more. Again came the three rapid taps, the pause, the three slower taps, another pause, and then the three final taps in quick succession. Again, the creature alighted on the glass, with its head resting on the same quarter-point of the compass. Now, I'm not naturally a superstitious man, but I don't mind admitting that I felt a very curious feeling stealing over me as I stood alone in that cabin and watched that little greyish-white insect spell out the signal, which is never sent out unless a vessel be in dire straits and then come to rest pointing so unerringly to a course so near our own. It was useless for me to try to persuade myself that it was pure coincidence, that the three fluttering taps might be the natural movements of the moth, that there might be something on the covering glass of the compass which would account for the thing always seeking the same spot. Try as I might, I could not get it out of my head that the little moth was trying to tell me to shift my helm a quarter of a point to the south. Still, one does not act on impulse when in charge of an ocean liner, nor does one depart from the specified track without good cause. First of all, I must make sure that my imagination was not playing a trick on me. I slipped on my uniform, and quietly made my way aft to the first officer's berth. MacAndrew was a hard-headed and eminently practical Scot, in whose sound common sense I felt I could trust in such a case as this. He was asleep, but his eyes snapped open the instant I laid my hand on his shoulder. "'Anything wrong, sir?' he cried, as he recognized me. "'Not exactly,' I answered. "'But I want your advice on a little matter that's been troubling me a bit.' Mac looked a little surprised, but he was a good deal more so when I led the way to my cabin and pointed to the compass. "'Why, it's nothing but a wee bit moth!' he cried. "'They call them gasty flatters, up where I was born, them being white, you see.' I interrupted him by holding up my hand. "'Watch, and listen,' I said, purposely refraining from telling him what to expect, in case it should unconsciously influence his judgment. As I spoke, a slight movement began to agitate the soft, downy wings, and presently—tap, tap, tap! 
tap, 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 tap. McAndrew glanced round at me when the wings had become still. If I'd have heard that on a wireless receiver, I'd have thought I was listening to an S.O.S., he said slowly. It's been rapping out the same three letters for the past half hour, I told him, and every time it has come to rest over the same point of the compass. He craned his neck upward, and I saw him start. God preserve us, he jerked out. The wee beastie is heading within a quarter of a point of our aim course. I nodded silently, for the moth was again repeating its strange message. West, south, west, quarter south, I read, as the frail wings ceased quivering, and I'm very much tempted to follow the new course. He gave me a long, searching look before replying. Yon is a matter about which Naaman can advise another, sir, he said at length. It's something clean beyond the rules of seamanship and navigation. But speaking for myself, sir, if I were in command of this packet, I'd shift my helm to the quarter where your poor beastie seems trying to guide us. I stood for a long while in thought after he had finished speaking. A young master mariner can make or mar his reputation on his first trip. I had been given the command over the heads of older and more experienced men— and I well knew that my conduct would be closely and jealously watched, and, if needs be, criticised. If I were to veer out of the usual track and ill came of it, I would be a marked man for the rest of my life, and I'd seen too many out-of-work shipmasters kicking their heels round the agent's offices not to know what that meant. On the other hand, there was the little white moth fluttering out the message that no sailor worth his salt can listen to unmoved and pointing persistently to the south. I was not a man who loved taking chances, but, for good or ill, I determined to take one then. I turned briskly. "'Pass the word to the quartermaster, Mr. MacAndrew,' I ordered. "'The course is west-south-west, quarter-south.' "'Quarter-south it is, sir,' the old Scotsman returned, with glistening eyes. Then he raised his hand and touched his cap reverently. May the good Lord reward you if you're doing right, and may He help you if you're not. He went out on the bridge, and a few seconds after I saw the lubber line, which coincides with the head of the ship, veer round until it came abreast of the spot where the moth was resting, showing that we had swung on to the new course. Almost at the same moment, as though it knew that its mission had been accomplished, the little moth fell to the deck, quivered for an instant, and then was still for ever. I gently lifted the little dead messenger, placed it in an empty matchbox, and stowed it away in my locker. I have it still, and sometimes, when things go wrong, and the world seems to be just a huge ant hill of humanity, ruled by blind chance and brute instincts, I take out that matchbox and look upon the tiny white moth that came to me in mid-Atlantic, and my faith is restored. For thirty-six hours after changing course, we sighted the old Rangoon, outward bound and crowded, and blazing from bridge to stern. Over a thousand souls lived to bless the change of course, indicated by that little winged messenger, and among them was the lady who is now my wife. And that's why I have a tender spot in my heart for the little light-blinded creatures which flutter in out of the night. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.